Hey everybody, Darren Burroughs here. Today I'm with Luke Boyron and Luke and I are going to talk about how to wholesale properties and how to find off-market deals. Luke is Canada's largest wholesaler and I'm so excited that he's here with me today to discuss everything that he does in the real estate investing world. Before we get into it with Luke today, if you haven't done so already, you can subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell, and please feel free to leave comments and questions below for me. And without further ado, let's get into it. Luke, so great to have you here this morning. I know that you're a busy guy. Thanks for taking time out of your day to join me. Why don't you give everyone a bit of a background on who you are and what you do as a real estate investor? Sure. Thanks for having me on, Darren. Uh, so I've been investing in real estate since 2007 when I bought my first rental property and uh, bought a few rentals here and there over the years. And then uh, at the end of 2016, I uh, got called to the bar, left law and started flipping a good number of, of houses, was running around managing job sites and things like that. And it was sometime near the end of 2017, I had seven renovations on the go at the same time, just really myself coordinating them. And I got an amazing deal and I just couldn't handle doing another renovation. And I found another investor to assign the contract to. And that was, uh, you know, my first assignment deal or my first wholesale deal, which uh, essentially when I assign the contract to another investor. After that, I kept flipping a few more and I've really gone more and more towards uh, wholesaling and wholetailing uh, properties and grown a team around that business. Um, I'd like to think we're, we're very good at finding uh, good deals on real estate and finding off-market properties and helping sellers out of bad situations. And um, by doing so, we're able to get a discount that allows us to assign the contract to other investors. And that's where we make our money. You had seven active flips on the go. Um, how were you able to acquire those properties? And was that sort of where you learned how to essentially work with buyers to find a price that made sense for you to then find some profit on the backside? And was that how you kind of got into wholesaling was that first interaction? Yeah, I, a lot of my first flips were MLS deals. And I mean, there are still opportunities on the MLS. They're just hard to find. And what I really found was um, in, in order for me to buy so many, I was using private financing. So part of it was I was giving up, uh, I was doing an equity split with someone who would put, bring all of the capital, which was the down payment, the renovation money, um, closing costs, et cetera. And I was getting private financing to get an 80% first. So that the cost of the private financing were a lot. Yeah. Um, and then I was giving up half of my profits to an equity partner. When I looked at the deal, that property that I sold to somebody else, um, I was able to make a good assignment fee in part because the person buying it was using a line of credit, credit on their primary. So there, well, not only that, the person who bought it from me managed the renovation project himself. So he was much more involved because he wasn't doing seven at the same time. Um, and he was able to keep costs lower. He was a realtor, so he saved on commissions when he was reselling it, and he <clears throat> he didn't have the private financing costs, which would have cost me uh, thirty to fifty thousand on that property. <laughs> so he was able to right. save all of those costs and make more money on the back end. But also meant he could pay me more. So I started realizing, you know, what I'm paying in private financing. Sometimes people don't have that much of those costs, or even the equity portion, which can be very expensive because if you're very profitable, you're giving up a lot. I realized, wait, I could just assign this contract to somebody else, make possibly as much money sometimes mm -hmm. um, or, or a little less, but I don't have to do the entire project. And they're still able to make <clears throat> what I was planning on making on the flip because they have lower costs than I do. So what was the next transaction after that? Or how did you start to sort of start your business as a wholesaler versus more of a you know active flipper? The first wholesale I did was off of, I think it was actually an organic Google result, but um, I was doing Google ads around that time. I had started doing Google ads, online marketing, looking for, for private sellers to contact us. What are the strategies that you kind of use? And can you explain a little bit about each one of those strategies? We have Kijiji ads going. We get a, you know, we don't get a lot of deals from that. It, it's a small lead source, but it's worth doing. Referrals are great. Other, other people who either send us deals or wholesalers who want to work with us, um, you know, that we can kind of join venture on, on selling a property, that kind of thing. Uh, Google ads, Google organic through the SEO. And now the Google, my business page seems to be taking up a bit. Uh, we're doing Facebook ads as well. Um, we'll do neighborhood flyers. We'll do um, flyers in, in, in areas, you know, that we want to buy houses. Essentially we'll pick and we'll, we'll hit the whole neighborhood with those. We do try to do targeted lists, but they're, you know, driving for dollars and we're mainly looking for rundown houses. The lawn hasn't been mowed. Roof looks really bad. 
boarded up windows if possible. Um, those are more time consuming, but we try to get kind of more targeted in those ways. So, because uh, we can't, in the US, they just pull a list when they drive for dollars and then they skip trace them. Um, inexpensive bulk skip tracing in the US, I haven't found that in Canada. Mm -hmm. So we actually go to the city. So for example, we're in Oakville. We'll go to City Hall in Oakville and we'll ask to see the tax rolls. And then we can look at each house and see where is the tax bill being mailed because we don't want to mail to a boarded up house. That's not probably not going to help us. And we don't want to mail to tenants who aren't taking care of the house. We want to mail to the owner and then we can send, you know, a letter to the owner saying, you know, we're not saying, Hey, your house looks like crap, but kind of saying <laughs> we're, we're looking at, we're investors. We're looking to buy a house privately. If you're interested in selling, give us a shout. Can I ask a question around the tax? Thing. So that's obviously information that we can access as investors is that, you know, it's not anything private. You can go in and ask to see the tax roll and, and where that's Absolutely. And some cities will try to tell you it's private, but it isn't. Mm -hmm. You can see the tax roll for any city. Now you may not want to tell them why you're doing it, but the tax roll is public information. I guess this is where your legal background comes in handy. You know, my dad taught me that. So. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's good. Good to know for sure. So you're doing all of the back end marketing uh, to sort of funnel those opportunities back to you. And then I'm guessing you're hiring somebody to actually answer the phone. Is that their job and is to talk to the sellers? Um, so what I ended up doing was um, hired an acquisition person whose sole job was answer the calls from sellers and go to meet sellers. You don't have to worry about the rest of the process. I'll get the phone to ring. I'll help sell the deals afterwards. Uh, you know, I'll take care of all the back end stuff. Your job is to answer the phone, meet with sellers, get the property under contract. Um, and spent, you know, months and better part of a year really training him up to get very good at that. Mm -hmm. And he is very good now. What is the biggest, I guess, takeaway do you have or the biggest piece of training you gave them to say, here's the kind of things you want to do when you're talking to a potential seller. And then also when they arrive at the property, what are they potentially because you're not going to go in and for lack of a better term, shit talk the property. That's not really going to be exciting for anybody. What approach do you take uh, on both of those things? We shit talk the property when the seller wants to shit talk the property. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, if the seller says, oh, I've moved out. My ex-boyfriend lived here and he just didn't take care of it. It's disgusting. He didn't fix anything. Like, yeah, you're right. He did. It. He really didn't take care of this house. Terrible. It's terrible. Yeah. But most of the time, you know, we'll walk into a house and, you know, the dog will pee on my foot. And, and I'll be like, oh yeah, you raised your family here. It's so lovely. Yeah. Um, I can really see, you know, obviously you understand buyers nowadays, they, they watch HGTV. They want everything to look new. I really see how great this home is. The bones are wonderful. Um, I can see it's been a wonderful family home for you. Um, we, we would just give this a bit of a facelift to look at, make it look pretty like people want on HGTV nowadays. If people have lived there and raised their kids there, we're not trying to make them feel like their home is a bad house. Mm -hmm. They have sentimental attachment to it often. So you, you do have to a little bit tailor the message depending on, on the person. Um, and, and, but on, on the other side, the, the calls coming in, we've, we've now separated that. So the acquisition person doesn't take the call from the sellers anymore. We have a, a lead intake person who takes the call from the sellers. And um, part of the reason we do that is the lead intake person is they're not a salesperson at all. They're not supposed to be. They're not trying to sell the person on anything. They're there to make the person comfortable. They're there to gather information. Um, understand, you know, what that seller needs and, and if there's a way that we can help them. Um, and something else is they try to, and they've gotten pretty good at this. Uh, they try to get an idea of the value of the property based on quick, you know, what they can find publicly of what's listed, what's sold, depending on, on where it is and what access they have, trying to get an idea of what that property might be worth. Um, and if the seller isn't being completely unreasonable, like if their property's worth 600 and they're asking 700, um, we're, they're not going to set the appointment. But if the seller's being more reasonable where they're asking, you know, a little bit under market maybe, and so there may be some room to negotiate there, then they'll go ahead and they'll set, they'll set our acquisition rep on that appointment um, right then and there. How does that conversation lead to the opportunity for them to have another showing where you bring in now your, your potential buyers that you're going to wholesale to? How do you explain that to the sellers? Well, part of it started off because when I was flipping houses, I had some money partners who would want to be on title of the property. Mm. That kind of was always the conversation was, well, my money partner might want to be on title. They're, they might want to see the property. You know, we can keep that open as an option. We might want to bring contractors through. So it's kind of a broad uh, I'm not sure who I'm going to bring through, but I may need to bring a few different people through um, to determine 
what I want to do, or even, you know, I, I might want to go through the property myself. Whereas, you know, my acquisition rep seeing it, if I'm going to close on it, I might want to see it myself to confirm, um, to confirm that, you know, there's nothing that that's been missed. How does the negotiation work with the sellers? What, what's the first step in sort of establishing that price point and what you're going to be able to buy it for? Part of that is understanding what we can pay, right? Like I said, that spreadsheet that I initially created, it, it's very simple. Um, but essentially it runs in, if we're closing this with private financing and we have a certain margin we need to make and we have land transfer tax and all these other costs. And if it's just a purely cosmetic renovation, this is, this is essentially what we can pay for the house. So, um, that usually is what goes into what we can offer the sellers, right? We will offer maybe just under that, um, to give us a little bit of room to, to negotiate, but that's, that's what we base it on. We kind of base it on, um, this is what we can pay. So we've seen your home. This is what we can offer you, which is, you know, you don't have any real estate agent commissions to pay. You don't have to fix anything. Um, if we, if we both agree, you can leave your, your stuff behind in the house, uh, you know, junk that you don't want, or, you know, if you inherited the house and you don't want to rent a bin to get throw out, you know, take, take the valuables that you liked or, you know, sentimental things that you inherited, but the rest of, you know, the old couches from the sixties, leave them there, we'll throw them out. Um, so we, we can negotiate all of those things into a contract and there's a few special things we can offer that they really would never get off of the MLS. Um, for example, you know, rent backs or staying in the house after closing or, uh, where we give them a mortgage before closing so they have money to go buy another place. Explain that, um, the mortgage element a little bit. We've done this a couple of times. It's especially when there's a longer closing. So uh, I can think of an example in Georgetown. Um, the sellers, they, they had some hospice bills for, for the father. Um, they didn't necessarily have money, to, first of all, to fix the house, but also they didn't, you know, paycheck to paycheck like most Canadians, right? It's pretty normal but they didn't have money to go put a deposit to buy their next property. And, and that's, that's a difficulty actually. And something we don't think about often, but you know, you might have a lot of equity in your home, but not much cash in your bank account. And how do you put that deposit down on another property when they might want, you know, 20 to $50,000 as a deposit for the next property. So what we did was we said, we'll give you a $42,000 deposit. And what we do will do is we'll secure this as a mortgage on the property. And once the mortgage is registered, um, it'll be released to you. So you can use this money between now and closing. It's interest free. Um, as long as we close on time, it's interest free. If we don't close because of you, then it starts accruing at, you know, I don't know, 15 or 20% per year or something like that. So we expect you to close. But the advantage of that was, you know, and we pay, we, we priced that in that we'd have to pay the legals to register the mortgage and discharge it. Mm -hmm. We gave them the money. They then had, you know, a couple months, they were able to use that money for moving, you know, pay for a moving truck, um, pay uh, deposit on their next place. For some other people, it's first and last. In this case, they bought a house. So they were able to use that as to put a deposit down. Um, and so that really helped them buy the next house. Whereas the other option was they sell this house and they have nowhere to go because they don't get that deposit. The deposit's held in trust by the lawyer typically. So what do they use to move to the next place? I guess, you know, maybe they could have scrounged up a bit of money to rent a cheap place, get first and last together on a cheap place and have to live in a cheap place for a year, at, you know, live out their lease and then, or, or stay at an Airbnb. It, it's tough. It's a much more difficult situation here. We gave them a good option where they had the money now to pay off some bills, move and put a deposit on their next place. And there is a perception in the wholesaling world that, you know, you're taking advantage of people who are sort of down and out and, and coming in and, and uh, trying to offer them, you know, the, the lowest price for their property. So, you know, what is your perspective on that? And what, what is that sort of uh, the way do you position it to anyone else who's like a bit of a naysayer? Yeah, I mean, we hear that all the time, especially it's funny, Facebook's a place where you have, if you have Facebook ads going, the hate we get is, uh, it's pretty serious. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we hear, oh, you're a scam, you're this or that. No, we're not. We offer an option to other, to people who need that option. We've never made a seller sign. You know, it's always their choice. Um, and we, we've usually say to sellers, Hey, why don't you list this? You'll probably get more money if you list this on the MLS. And they usually have a reason like, and sometimes the reasons don't make a ton of sense. Like, Hey, I have 12 cats and I'm afraid that if there's realtors coming through, one of the cats is going to get out and get hit by a car. And I'm not willing to risk that. I just want to sell privately. Okay you know, that's what we're offering. And if they see the value in, in what we're offering, then so be it. In terms of trying to rip them off, 
That's a difficult one. I mean, take a house in Toronto um, with private financing, double land transfer tax. If it's worth 1.8 million right now on the MLS, I buy, if I buy it for 1.5, pay all those costs, the legal, the land transfer, the financing, private financing, realtor commissions. If I buy it for 1.5, sell it at 1.8, I lose money. That's a $300,000 discount that someone's going to say, wow, you just took $300,000 from them. No, I just lost money. I need to offer a discount in order to even break even. So I have to build in a price where I can make a little bit of money. If I just, if all I'm doing is closing it on and, and reselling on the MLS. Now, if the seller doesn't see the value in that, then they're not going to sell to us. Yeah. Um, but we're actually offering an option to somebody else. I, another example I have is, um, a house we bought in Ottawa, they, they should never have been homeowners. They owned the house for 20 years. For the last five years, they didn't have running water. Um, they have two kids living in the house, teenagers now. And one of the kids is sleeping on a mattress pad on a pile of garbage because they were hoarders. Um, and because they didn't have running water, they, well, they first started using the bathtub as a toilet. And then when that, the drain started leaking into the kitchen, they plugged the bathtub and it filled up. And then they started using jugs of water as a bathroom and throwing that into a back addition that had collapsed. So there were about 300 jugs of urine and stuff in the back addition. And these are kids are living in this house, right? And the bank was about to take the house back. They called us, they said, the bank, we've, we've gotten a letter, the sheriff's coming in a week to kick us out of the house. So clearly they buried their head in the sand. They could have listed it on the MLS because it was in Ottawa, the area it was in hot area. There's uh, the house, has gotten torn down and two houses are being built in its place. Mm. Um, so they could have sold it on the MLS, but here's the thing. They didn't have the money to pay for another place. If you think of it as power of sale, technically what happens in power of sale is the bank will sell it. Now there's a lot of legal costs. Obviously there are realtor commissions. They have to get multiple appraisals that all get charged back to you, et cetera, et cetera. All those costs come back to the homeowner. But if there's any equity left over, which there would have been um, after it's sold, the homeowner gets that. But that might be a six to a month to a one year process between the time the homeowner gets kicked out by the sheriff and the time they get paid back any equity there is in the house. In that case, that family would have been on the streets. They wouldn't have had the money to pay for rent. They wouldn't have had anywhere to live. So what we did was we said, okay, we'll close within the week and we'll give you a month to stay in the house for free as you look for a rental. Because we'll have closed, you'll have gotten all of your equity, which they were getting a couple hundred thousand dollars in equity out of this house after we bought it, you'll get all of your equity. And now you can go find a place to rent. And in this case, they found a three bedroom running water. The landlord's going to make sure that the, you know, the water doesn't get shut off because of pipe breaks. Um, the landlord's going to be responsible for that. And the kids have their own bedrooms and their own beds. Like their life is so much better. They should never have been homeowners in the first place. But the other, the alternative was that the bank literally kicks them to the street and they live in a shelter for months, uh, possibly up to a year waiting for the money from the bank. So let's flip to the other side from the buyer's side. How did you start to create your buyer's list? And um, how did you find people uh, to essentially wholesale the properties to? I definitely started building a list just off of going to real estate uh, events, like just meetups, um, talking to people, handing out my card, telling them what I do. Um, we've now paid on a little bit of paid marketing, like Facebook ads for, for buyers, things like that. Um, but most of it is just organic. When we grew into Ottawa, I went and spoke at a couple real estate investing events there as well, just to kind of get the word out on what it is we do. The good thing about it is when, when there's good deals, I mean, you, you've bought from us. It's, mm -hmm. not, it's not exactly a hard sales pitch to be like, hey, you get to save money on your next investment property, right? It's, it's like, ooh, <laughs> great. Have you had the situation? I was, I was talking with uh, Katerina uh, when I was looking at a property here in Toronto. And uh, we were talking about, you know, the, 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 the whole system in Canada and the way that we have to disclose, obviously. And anything that I've bought from you, we agree on a price. And then when I, before I sign that document with you, I see what you make on the, on the, what you bought the property for and then what the wholesale fee is. Um, and have you had people see that and say that's too much money and back out of the deal at that point? How do you deal with that situation? Yeah, I mean, we've done assignment fees as small as I think $1,500. Um, but we have some larger ones as well. And I, I understand emotionally, sometimes people are like, oh, you're getting a large assignment fee. But at the same time, it really should only matter what they're getting the property for. Because if, if they would have paid 400, if they would have been willing to pay 400,000 on the MLS for it, and they're buying it for 370, 
what if I bought it for a dollar and I'm making a $370,000 assignment fee? Should that matter to the person? Mm. Well, only if it affects their financing, right? Where it makes it more difficult. But if otherwise they would be happy buying it at that price, it doesn't matter. In my opinion, it shouldn't matter what I make. There are a few people who are just, you know, upset if we make a lot of money or, but usually those are, those aren't going to be the very active real estate investors. Um, and I understand emotionally it can, you know, some people can be a little upset, but at the same time, any of the regular buyers, any of the, the people who flip a lot of houses, uh, any of the experienced real estate investors, it doesn't matter to them. It, they care about what they're getting the property for. They've been looking for a good deal. They got a good deal. And then they see what we make. And, and it's funny, some people are, you know, they're upset when they see that we make 10 grand. And I'm like, but well, what do you think we're doing here? We're not, you know, we pay a lot in marketing. What are we going to lose money on the properties? What are yeah. we supposed to do? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, we've, we get that a little bit or we get people once they see what we make, try to renegotiate based on that, which again, based on what we make doesn't affect what the price is, right? Like the price that you agreed to is the price that you agreed to. It shouldn't matter what proportion that is to us. For me as a buyer, you know, it makes sense to be, I want to do volume on transactions, uh, you know, and so for me to see those assignment fees is fine. It's something that you've built your team, you've put on in all this time and effort to be able to do that. And I'm okay to pay you for your time and your service. Everyone's got to get paid, right? And I think that when those situations arise, everybody feels like they bring value to the equation. To me, it's a win-win situation. And I don't see why anyone would be offended by by an assignment fee for what you've done to get that property under contract. Luke, thanks so much for taking some time today to walk through this with me. I think this is going to be really interesting for a lot of people because to know the the inner workings of of how you sort of operate. If you guys enjoyed the session with Luke today, go ahead and hit that like button below. You can also subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell, and please feel free to leave comments and questions below for me. You can also follow me on Facebook, Instagram, or check out my website at darrenboros.com. With that, I'll say, Luke, thanks so much for your time today and your willingness and openness to talk about how you you work as a wholesaler. Uh, I wish you the best of success in your, in your real estate investing journey. I look forward to buying more properties from you and your team. Uh, you're really a pleasure to work with. And I want to say just have a great rest of your weekend. I look forward to chatting with you again soon. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me, Darren.